I come to you to talk today, as I said before at the Left Forum, those of you who had missed it, I'm not coming here to talk to you as a progressive. I'm not coming here to talk to you as a liberal. I'm coming here to talk to you as a revolutionary. Yeah. And I, think, yeah. I think the the purpose of making that distinction is that we're not talking about putting a Band-Aid on a gashed wound. We're not talking about trying to hide and conceal a festering wound that is bleeding our country dry. We're not talking about a simple reform where we glaze over the historical issues that we've had. And I think that one thing that we must remember is that when we're dealing with the Green Party, we're dealing with the non-watered down positions that the Democrats pretend to have. And the morality that many of them have abandoned in order to grasp onto the party allegiance. In other words, I, I very famously had an argument uh, with a person, I guess this thing went viral, when I explained to them that how could the president talk about Black Lives Matter? If you wanna hold up a picture of Trayvon Martin of Michael Brown and talk about how these individuals have been victims of violence that specifically target them. You know what, Mr. President, I have some pictures of some black and brown children that were killed by your drone strikes that were authorized through metadata. And that's not moral, that's not right. And it's our responsibility as not the corporate left, but the real left, the real revolutionaries to sit here and confront that, not just when we see it from the right wing, but when we see it from people who pretend to be from the left, from people who pretend to have those moral principles, for people who say that they're progressive about everything, until we start talking about gay rights, until we start talking about Palestine, until we start talking about other uncomfortable issues that forces us to look into the history of what we're discussing. And one of those things that I would like to talk about today very briefly is immigration. And I feel like this is an incredibly important topic because there are things that we've never discussed, um, even considering the lexicon of that as a larger argument, right? For example, we're still a prisoner very much in the mainstream media to the bootstrap mythology. And for those people who don't understand what that is, that's when European immigrants, who many of them did not come here through Ellis Island, actually the vast majority of them came here illegally, have developed this idea that, you know what, my ancestors came from uh, Greece or from Eastern Europe or from Armenia or Italy or, or Ireland, and they pulled themselves up by their bootstrap. Well, why haven't you black and brown people done that? And I think something that's really left out of this experience is that during the late 1800s and early 1900s, these immigrants, many of them suffering incredibly and, and experiencing very difficult hardships when coming here to this country, still have advantages they didn't understand that they have. They didn't just come here and apply for citizenship, ladies and gentlemen, they came here and they applied to be white. They applied for whiteness. Why? Because if they didn't have whiteness, they weren't allowed to join unions, right? They weren't allowed to join the fire department or the police force that translates into political power locally. I mean, the fire department had to tell this club it's okay to have a certain amount of people here, and they make everybody pay for the privilege of me telling you what you can do. They weren't allowed to take out loans, so they were redlined, districted. So I think that when we start discussing these things, we have to take the conversation all the way back. And one thing that I've always appreciated about the Green Party, and in many ways the Libertarian Party, is that they're actually willing to have these conversations. They're willing to do this debate, and they're willing to say, hey, bring it on down. We have history and facts on our side. We have the ability to have a rational discussion with you about these things, and the problem is they constantly want to stifle that. So what do they do to the American public? They present the diet soda version of the positions that the Green Party has continuously held for years and years and years upon it. You know, I, I, I want to say something else very quick because it's important for me not just to discuss indigenous issues and discuss the people that are being demonized when immigrants may not run America, but ladies and gentlemen, we make America run. And I know that everyone recognizes that in this room, so I feel a sense of camaraderie. But one thing I have to point out before I leave, because I want to make this very brief, is about purposeful injustice, right? I went to Afghanistan in 2009 uh, under a humanitarian project led by Omade International. Uh, I used the proceeds of an album I had to, along with them, build an orphanage and a school there. And you can see it on omeid.org. The reality is when I started conversing with the people, I didn't come there as a conqueror. I didn't come there as a fake NGO member working for the CIA secretly. I came there as a student to learn from the people. 
and I asked them about individuals that were stolen from their homes and had been sold recently in an article to the CIA and to uh, 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 special forces as members of the Taliban or members of Al Qaeda. And realistically speaking, the vast majority of these people had as many ties to Al Qaeda and the Taliban as the fucking people in this room. The reality is that they were sold for a specific purpose. And I asked them, what's the purpose? And I said, and the man responded to me very clearly and said, of course there's innocent people being tortured at Bagram. Of course there's innocent people being tortured at Guantanamo. There are supposed to be innocent people being tortured there. Otherwise, it wouldn't be frightening to the people that you're trying to use fear as a control method to control. Because ladies and gentlemen, you as a journalist aren't afraid to write the truth, but what if you didn't write anything wrong at all? And you realized, man, anything that I write that may be even construed as critical of this society can bring down the ultimate consequences, not on just me, but of my family. And that's where in the fear takes control of us. And I'm here to tell you and close this out by saying, stop being afraid. I know many of you don't have fear. But what I need you to do is carry this message out into the world. And please remember something. When you know a lot more about a subject than somebody, that's not a debate. You're teaching them something. Don't be afraid to go out into the world and teach people what you know about what's really going on. Now, are you going to get pushback? Absolutely. You know why? Because if I broke into your house and I woke you up at 4 o'clock in the morning, your first impression wouldn't be, oh, man, this guy's waking me up. Because I know he'd be like, who the hell is this stranger I've never met before who I'd just seen speak once at the Jill Stein campaign? How the fuck did they get into my house and why are they touching me? The reality is that if anyone's asleep, they don't want to be woken up. So when you confront people that are that are ec politically asleep, that are economically asleep, that are asleep in terms of their position on the environment because they don't realize that we've used up almost over 30% of the plant's natural resources in the past 100 years, of course you're not gonna get a good result. But sometimes if the house is on fire and you love these people, you gotta slap them in the face and say, hey, wake up, man, the house is on fire. It's not a sustainable system. We have to have a change. We have to have a change in the political discourse of this country and we have to have a change to the corrupt, two party system that has played us off like good cop, bad cop for too many years, which is why I'm here to say that I appreciate the message that Jill Stein and the Green Party are putting out, and I hope we get to hear more of that in more elections to come, not just presidentially, but definitely locally as well. Thank you very much, Jill, and thank you to everybody on the team.